just want to welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for a collaborative divorce 201 advanced topics with Russell Alexander, Carrie Heinzel, and Jarrett Johnson. My name is Shannon and I'm part of the community engagement and events team at Russell Alexander Collaborative Family Lawyers. I'm going to start with a bit of housekeeping and I'll let you know what's on the agenda today. I'll also be introducing our panelists today um, and then we'll be passing things over to them to get started with their presentation. I'll be available behind the scenes along with Stephanie, our articling student, um, for any tech issues or support that you need throughout the presentation. So if you are having any challenges throughout um, or have any questions for us, you can contact me at shannon at russellalexander.com and I'll do my best to help resolve the issue. Um, I'll make sure to put my email in the chat box for your reference as well. And just a quick note that you'll notice that the chat function has been disabled on your end, and this is just to ensure that you remain anonymous to other audience members. But as I mentioned, if you need anything um, or if you need to get in touch with our team or to send in questions today, you can do so through the Q&A or through email. So to let you know what's on the agenda today in this one hour presentation, Russell, Carrie, and Jarrett will be sharing their insights on collaborative practice, and they'll be covering the following topics. They're going to first of all start off with a little bit of a recap from our Collaborative Divorce 101 presentation that we did in December. Next, they'll be covering full teams. Are you working remotely? And what are the advantages and disadvantages of working remotely? What do you foresee will be the standard for practicing in the future, remote, hybrid, or in office? How do you manage all the documents you need for a collaborative case? How are the changes to the Divorce Act impacting collaborative practice? Expert reports, runaway trains, saving the golden goose, and then impasse and hitting a wall. And then our panels will also be saving some dedicated Q&A time at the end of the presentation, along with some questions that will be answered throughout, but we will save a bit of time at the end of the presentation for any questions coming in. So we'll do our best to get to, to as many as we can um, during that time. And we also just ask you to keep in mind that the content of this webinar is to provide you with general information on separation and divorce and is not to be considered as legal advice. And just one last note um, before we get to our introductions, I just want to mention that I'll be providing links to helpful resources um, mentioned throughout the presentation on today's topic in a follow-up email tomorrow, so you can keep an eye out for that. So without further ado, I'm gonna get to introductions of today's hosts from the Greater Toronto Area. We have Russell Alexander, Carrie Heinzel, and Jarrett Johnston. So to start off, we have Carrie Heinzel, who is the founder of Fairmore Family Law Solutions. Fairmore offers independent fact-based financial analytics and settlement insights to individuals and couples working through separation and divorce. And Carrie is an active collaborative process trainer, co-teaching the introductory program for new collaborative professionals and advanced level trainings for the seasoned practitioner. She has taught st statistic research methodologies and psychology at college and university levels. In addition, Carrie has presented at conferences for the Ontario Association of Collaborative Professionals, Family Dispute Resolution Institute of Ontario, Annual Conference, and the International Academy of Collaborative Professionals. Next up, we have Jared, and Jared practices primarily in family law, specializing in litigation, collaborative, and traditional settlement work. Jared also offers services in wills and estates and in real estate. And he sits on the executive board for the Kawartha Collaborative Practice, the executive board of the Victoria Halliburton Law Association, and is a director for the Children's Services Council. Jarrett is passionate about getting his clients the best results possible with the least amount of financial, mental, and emotional damage, whether in the boardroom or in the courtroom. Next, we have Russell, who is the founder and senior partner of Russell Alexander Collaborative Family Lawyers. And with over 20 years of experience, Russell offers a wealth of knowledge and expertise in collaborative family law. He uses his experience with a client-focused approach by creating unique solutions for each of his clients to enable them and their families to move forward with their lives in a compassionate and collaborative manner. So now that you know a little bit more about our panelists today and what's on the agenda, I'm gonna pass things over to Russell to get started. Thank you for those kind words, Shannon. Um, we have polls through it today, so please participate. It's anonymous. Some of the feedback we've gotten from previous live events is uh, people really like the interaction of the polls, so please participate. Q&A throughout, throw your uh, any questions that you have into um, the chat. Shannon's going to let us know what they are. We'll answer them as we go throughout the program. 
and please provide us with your feedback when this is over so we know how we can improve this and make this better. We do have a dream team this week. I say that every week, but this is a, a really great group that we have uh, joining us. And with, since we have such a great team, Shannon, are you able to offer our guarantee? As always, um, we hope that everyone enjoys the presentation today, but you know, if um, anyone's unsatisfied, we are offering a money back guarantee for our free webinar today. Great. <laughs> you can't go wrong. Let's run that poll, let's get at it. Thank you so much. So we're going to do polls throughout just to get a flavor of our audience and to find out what people think. First poll questions on the screen. Uh, what is your reason for joining us today? You're going through a separation or divorce or you're a legal professional, other professional. You want to learn more to help a friend or something else. If you have something else, you can put it into the box. Shannon's going to get it to the host. So we'll give everybody a few minutes to uh, get their answers in. And while we're waiting, let's go back to one of our audience questions, which we have in advance. So thank you who sent the questions in advance. Um, so we started off by asking, how do you get the opposing spouse to start in collaborative when we were doing our introductions? Uh, Carrie, what, how do you convince opposing counsel to take the collaborative route? Can you give me an answer in a minute or less? I can. I think the best thing to get a, uh, the other counsel, not opposing the other counsel oh, yeah. on so board. The adversarial term, right? Okay, this is the advanced group. Okay, <laughs> go ahead. So a, a really great way of getting the other counsel involved is asking them why they are hesitant to move we're having some audio um, there. Asking, finding the answer why can usually usually has nothing to do with collaborative it has on getting people on board okay are we back yeah your audio is cutting out a little bit but uh good answer ask why and what the refusal is or why they're reluctant so let's take a look at our poll results all right, so going through separation and divorce, almost 30% legal professional, close to 30, other professional, 30%, helping a friend and other, 6%. So fairly uh, diverse audience today. Thank you for answering that. We're just gonna do a real quick recap. So we did uh, an introduction to collaborative divorce a few weeks ago. I think Shannon can make that video available if you wanna rewatch it you can uh, email her and she'll try to get you a link out. So just a high level overview of what we talked about the first time, the basics of collaborative practice, sign a participation agreement, the lawyers agree not to go to court. The lawyers also agree not to take advantage of each other's mistakes. So if we notice something wrong in the documents or they did the math correctly, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna identify that to make sure we come up with the correct result. We talked about the role of neutrals in the collaborative process. So we're not gonna go through this deeply today. That was done in 101. Today's more advanced topics. So the role of the family professional and the role of the financial neutral, how they interact with collaborative practice. And then finally, we also looked at the roadmap, which set out exactly the steps you're gonna follow to do your matter collaboratively. So you build the foundation, you introduce the parties to the process, you gather and exchange information, you identify goals and interests, you identify choices, you evaluate the consequence of each choice, and then you come to a decision and implement it. So that's you know a one hour presentation in a minute or less, but we're just doing a quick overview and recap from 101. If you wanna learn more about the basics, contact us and we'll get you the information. So let's do another quick poll and then we're gonna get into the substance of our program today. So poll number two, what we got on the screen here. All right, what are your biggest concerns about using a team? So you have two lawyers and your clients, but what if we bring other people in, a family professional, family neutral, someone else? So we wanna know what your concerns are about using a full team in the collaborative process. Who do you use? 
uh, do I need a full team? What are the benefits? What do I do if there is if uh, there is a team? How about the costs for the client or the process and all of the above? So what we want to get an understanding is uh, what your concerns are. If you haven't been using a full team or if you haven't participated in a full team, if you're going through the process, uh, why not? Or has this been explained to you? So we'll give everybody just a moment to answer those. And let's see if we can find, um, well, I do have a question on this, but I don't want to give away the answer quite yet because going into Carrie's next slide. <laughs> but maybe um, how does collaborative differ from mediation? Any, any takers for that one? This is an audience question that came in ahead of our uh, presentation. Jared? You can take that one if you want, sure. Ross. Uh, or Carrie, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to you. You know what? I think I think this is a great question for all of us, quite frankly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is a this is a common common question. Uh, in my initial consults, I always talk to clients about the difference between mediation and collaborative because uh, they both fall under that umbrella of family dispute resolution. Um, one thing that you see commonly with mediation. Um, is that the lawyers aren't directly present in the sessions. Um, and uh, with collaborative, when we do our, our group meetings, um, you have your lawyer sitting there presently with you. Um, I find that clients like that because of the efficiency. When you have on the spot legal advice in a meeting, there's no delay. Whereas if you go to a mediation session, you're there for an hour and a half, and then you have to schedule an appointment with your lawyer three weeks later, just to get some of those questions that popped into your brain during the mediation session answered, and then go back to the next session. There's a lot of delay uh, inherent in that process. So I find uh, a lot of clients like the on the spot lawyer present legal advice. Yeah, and not all mediators have legal training, right? And yeah. so sometimes the results different when you do collaborative, you have, you're still applying the legal model. You have, you're getting legal advice, but that was a great answer, Jared. Thank you. So let's take a look at our poll results. Um, who to use 17%, whether they need a full team, 14%, understanding the benefits, 21%, um, seven uh, costs, 40, almost 40% 40 cost mm -hmm. for the client is a big concern and all of the above. So quite a quite a variety of answers there. We're we'll just to leave that up for another minute, but let's go into full teams. Carrie. Yeah, you know, I'm a, I'm a big believer in the full team. Um, kind of just to add on to your question as well with mediation and, and why I really like full team is I look at collaborative as the best of all worlds. It takes the best parts of mediation and brings that into the process. It actually takes the best parts of litigation and brings it into the process and puts it all together. The wonderful thing about having a full team, so you have a financial expert dealing with everything that has to do with money, and you have a family professional who's dealing with the emotional aspects of divorce, they're dealing with parenting and those aspects, is that you have the right person doing the right job at the right time for the right amount of money. So people aren't scrambling, uh, wondering what's going on. I like full teams because I find that having that family professional, they're a great asset to the financial professional because money is emotional. My view has always been, if you don't think money is emotional, uh, try pumping gas and then realizing you don't have your debit card um, to, to pay for it or win the lottery. I, I can say hand on heart that if I win the lottery, I will be highly emotional and y'all will probably hear it throughout the entire province of Ontario. So I'm just saying I'm gonna see you again if you win the lottery, right? <laughs> well, exactly. It'll be back. Um, but it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing. And the great thing is, is that we can rely on each other's expertise to make sure we're giving those clients the best possible service. They're getting a fulsome, expert-driven process and, and agreement. Yeah. It's wonderful. And, and it's tailored to their family. It's concierge, perfect service. 
Great answer. And you know, when we do the training and you guys spend a lot of time coaching new people to the collaborative process on how you sell team, right? Because yeah. there's a confidence level there if you're new to the process. Uh, what, what I just started doing is I just tell all my clients it's full team. That's just the way we do it. The clients don't know. Yeah. And I say, if we need to drop a, a team member off. So when we're talking about full team, it could be a family professional, financial professional, it could be a corporate lawyer, there could be a business evaluator involved. And, when, and I'll tell our clients, you know, if we need to, if we don't need somebody, then we won't include them on the team. But uh, that's usually how I get over that objection. But let's run a poll. I don't think we've run a poll for about 30 seconds. So let's go <laughs> up here. While we're running the poll, Russ, uh, my two cents on that is I, I usually turn the conversation around cost around and talk about the cost savings that are potentially right. there for using the full team, right? Mm -hmm. well, it's hard to see. It's hard to see when you, you've never gone through the process. But we, we talk about, uh, you know, debriefs we've had with our clients after and the cost savings that using one joint neutral family professional, using one joint neutral financial professional to gather the financial information instead of paying two different law firms. It's amazing. Once they get through it, they're like, oh, yeah, you're right. It did. It, it probably did save me paying your office. And, and my yeah. you know, it's such a great example. If you think uh, when we get family professionals on quickly, right? Oftentimes, they'll have a parenting plan ready for the first meeting. Uh, and mm -hmm. without that family professional, we'd be talking about parenting issues for maybe three, four hours. So you, yeah. they probably saved $1,000 just by bringing that one team member in early. So, yeah. Great point, Derek. Okay, so poll three, in working remotely, do you find, okay, work life is off kilter, working more than ever, what is the weekend? I think I've heard that from Carrie a couple times. <laughs> I am working less than ever. Well, oddly surprised if anybody answers that. <laughs> Hopefully none of my staff answer that question. Uh, <laughs> I'm working really weird hours into the day night. I love not wearing pants well uh, and all of the above. So um, I don't know. Can I answer this poll? <laughs> you gonna put that glove on? Yeah. Where are you going with this, Jarrett? <laughs> Let me answer, Jarrett. Hey, it's Jared, I have concern. <laughs> some wear a suit, some wear robes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, let's let's wait a minute. Uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Jared. What kind of robe? <laughs> only the Hugh Hefner. Only the. Hugh oh, Hefner. okay. Okay. <laughs> Just had a <to> check. <laughs> <laughs> that is the real life example. All right. Let's see what our audience <laughs> says here. Um, they probably think we're all gone nuts. <laughs> All right, work-life balance is off kilter, 25%. I'm not working. I am working more than ever, 14%. Was the weekend? Yeah, it's a couple answers there. Working less than ever. Well, put some uh, examples in the chat box so we can yeah. find out what you're doing. That sounds great. Uh, working weird hours, 21%. Love about wearing pants. Well, 20%, pretty strong showing. And all the above, it just uh, shows you the kind of world uh, we've evolved into. So thank you so much, everybody, for uh, answering those questions. All right. Jared, 18%, you have kindred spirits. Yeah, yeah. I like it. Go get that bathrobe on. <laughs> are you working remotely? What are the advantages and disadvantages? Okay, Jared, tell us about it. Yeah, I... Uh... I think there's lots of advantages of working remotely. A lot of people are stuck with the uh, commute. Uh, it avoids the commute. We're able to put in um, more flexibility to our day. Uh, a lot of people um, are able to now sort of blend family life with their work life through the day. If you have to run out to, to uh, pick a child up at school at midday, but you can get back for a meeting uh, in the afternoon, uh, I think this uh, remote working is um, giving us a little bit more flexibility in our lives. Um, and then, of course, uh, there's there's disadvantages as well. But that's a few advantages I've noticed in, in my work life. And I'm sure. <laughs> What's so funny? <laughs> Fabulous. 
And, and just, to, just to finish off my point, I think it's, it's opened up the ability for clients that maybe live in rural areas, maybe, maybe have transportation problems to attend uh, meetings. To, so there's been, there's been silver linings to, to this pandemic in terms of remote work and the flexibility and the efficiency. And I mean, there's some things we're doing now when it comes to coming together, that's just so much more efficient than the way we used to do things. You know, you add in Zoom divorce, right? So that you use this platform to do your divorce. It's really got the opportunity to make the justice system much more efficient and much more accessible, right? Those were the big complaints prior to the pandemic about family court. Takes too long and it costs too much, right? That's all we heard. Now, which was true, right? We wake up, we get it ready for the day. Uh, We'd commute to the office or to court find parking, maybe deal with traffic, go through court security, find your courtroom, find out where you're on the docket, wait three, four hours. Maybe the judge will send you back into the hall to work on something over lunch. Go back to see the judge, go home, six, seven hour day, right? Mm -hmm. At the expense of the client. Now we start at 1030. It starts pretty much at 1030 go for 45 minutes, maybe debrief your client. That six hour day is down to an hour and an hour and a half. So our clients are saving several thousand dollars by keeping us at home and doing it electronically. I think it's fantastic. Your thoughts, Carrie? You know, I I think there's, I've loved a lot of the advantages of working from home. I have to admit there is a ton of cost savings, not only to the clients, but to ourselves as professionals, which is wonderful. Yeah. I think, though, the biggest disadvantage is uh, working from home and doing this remotely is there's no longer a set line between what is a work in, a work life and what is my home life. Um, I have I am a really bad candidate in the sense that all of a sudden I'll wake up at 3 a.m. I'll go, oh, I forgot or, oh what about this or, or something? And then I'll go down into my office and I'm working and it's 3 a.m. And the part that shocks me the most is when I get the response back. Cause I've sent an email out and there had somebody started going, I was just thinking about this. So I think that's probably one of the biggest problems. And I think it's also changed expectations that because the professionals are working at home, that somehow we are also available 24 seven to our clients. Yeah, no, it's, you know, and there's a a mental health component to that too, right? Very large. You know, when I used to go in the office daily, I would meditate before I'd leave and when I come home, when I'd come home, but now I don't meditate anymore. It's just the whole day is one complete blur, right? There's no like off switch. You really got to be careful about your mental health. Yeah. Great, great insights, guys. Let's take a, let's do a poll. It's been too long. Um, <laughs> poll number four. All right, what do we have on the card here? What are your fears about leaving courts for collaborative? All right, so in pass, not making as much money, not being able to get my client to resolution, my client firing me and going back to court. I think everybody's always worried about that. All of the above. So we're going to let this run for a minute, but we had an audience question come in, which was fairly timely. Thank you for that. Um, So Carrie, I'm going to throw this out to you. How many professionals make up a team? Well, it's going to be, it depends. We always have legal counsel. So one legal counsel for each client, you will have one financial professional that will be your main financial professional. And that is a shared cost between both clients. And then we have one family professional, again, shared cost between both clients. Where things can now change and added professionals may come in. And it's usually at my first discretion as a financial professional and then speaking with the rest of the team is we now may need to bring in a corporate lawyer if we have large corporate issues that we need to deal with. We may need to bring in tax specialists um, to deal with any um, overarching tax matters. We may need to bring in mortgage brokers um, if somebody's trying to keep the house and they're having a hard time uh, doing that. 
real estate agents. There is 47 different um, disciplines within finance alone. And uh, your financial professional is not an expert in all 47 fields. It'd be impossible to do that. Um, but we do bring in those experts as we need them, as the file demands. So your core team is four people, but it can add on to that core depending on the needs of the family. Say the core is really six. If you're, yeah. if you're doing a lot of collaborative work, you have two lawyers. Basic team structure would include a family professional. Even if there's no kids, a family professional is going to help a lot and a financial professional. So I would say six. What do you think, Jared? Yeah, 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 absolutely. To Carrie's point, a lot of those extended professionals won't necessarily be collaboratively trained. So your core team, the, the, the two lawyers, the financial, the family, those, right. those individuals are, are experienced and trained in collaborative process. A lot of those extended professionals are excellent value adds to the process. Yeah. Uh, but they just might not have this this specialized training club. I think they're issue specific, right? Yeah, depending absolutely. on you know, there's something that could be at a, at the at the team's wheelhouse, right? Could be a, a business valuation or a tax issue or a corporate issue, yeah. and that's when yeah. you sprinkle sprinkle in other team members, maybe not for the full ride, but to deal with that one particular yeah. issue. Great answer. Absolutely, that is really helpful. All right, so let's see what our audience is saying. Um, biggest fears, impasse, mm -hmm. not making as much money, not being able to get the client to resolution, 36%. Uh, that was the highest turnout. Client firing you and going back to court, 18% or all of the above. So that was um, really insightful. Thank you everybody for participating. Next, we're gonna talk about um, what do you see the standard for practicing in the future? So what are you thinking here, Carrie? Oh, I'm going a hybrid completely and totally on this one. Um, I think there is a real need for all of us to move forward and to kind of get back to, I, I guess I'm gonna put in air quotes normal, but I think we're in our new normal right now. Um, but I can for I don't think Zoom's going away. I think this is a great way for us for people that have tight schedules, have lit work or live in remote locations, need to travel for work and they can still attend a meeting. I think it's fantastic. Um, I think there's going to be some in office need as well. Um, but I don't see working remotely going away. Um, but I don't think it's going to be permanently just one way. I'm looking at hybrid all the way. What do you think, Jarrett? Yeah, I agree. I think um, there's certain things in, in the court system um, that, that still um, will, will have some requirement for physical presence and physicality for trials, for example, and, and, and long motions where our judges want to test witnesses' demeanor and they want someone there on the spot. There's certain things that we're just not going to be able to do away with, with physical presence in and, and same goes with, with outside of court as well. There's certain times where people want that physical touch. They want that face-to-face. -face. And so I think there's going to be a big part of our society and our community that still wants that, that personal touch. And then there's going to be a huge part that wants the convenience and the flexibility of this new world we're living in. So absolutely, I agree 100%. I think I think uh, it's going to be one, it's not going to be a one shoe fits all. I think uh, everyone's going to be different in their perception on what they, how they want to see the process work, whether it's all, all Zoom or some physicality to, to the process. But absolutely, I think hybrid's going to be the future. Yeah. Yeah. I think it depends on what we're talking about, right? We're doing a presentation today on advanced CP. If we're talking about court, you know, as recently, I think it's November, there was a practice direction saying they're going to start going back to in-person hearings. That's gone out the window, right? It's going to be years before courts look anything remotely normal. And I think the administrative side of the court will be hybrid, right? You're going to do Zoom Rule 39 hearings and Zoom administrative hearings. Settlement conference trials will probably lean towards um, in-person when it's safe to do so. But when we talk about collaborative and when we talk to our colleagues in our practice groups, people hate 
not getting together, right? They love the group meetings. They love the monthly practice group meetings. I love going to council's office for the uh, banana bread and, you know, the banter, <laughs> the social part of being a collaborative professional, right? And so I think there's a real need for collaborative professionals to once again meet in person. And I can see that this process will return to in person mainly. I think there could be some use to the hybrid in terms of professionals calls or professional Zoom calls. But I think the meat and potatoes of the process of the actual full team meetings will probably return back to in person. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think that's the nature of a lot of collaborative professionals. They're very social, they want to engage in groups. And uh, that would be my take. Okay. You know, Russ, Russ, Sorry, I, was just, go. I was just going to add that, you know, I also think it's going to depend on the dynamics within that family that we're, right. we're having the team meetings on. I know I've heard from a lot of family professionals saying that, you know, for uh, items for like domestic violence, right. doing a Zoom meeting is a lot safer for a lot of people. And that, so I think we're going to be using this, um, um, in really interesting ways in the future and not just because we're in a pandemic. I think we're going to find creative ways to keep this going in some, in some things. And the access to justice issue too, right? Uh, yeah. People in rural or northern communities can now access professionals quite, quite easily where before they couldn't. Um, yeah. People in smaller communities uh, can access professionals. So I think there's a lot of benefits. I agree. That was a great point, Carrie. I think you have our next one here as well. We're going to not do a poll. Can you believe that? Oh, I love this question. <laughs> Are you being sarcastic? <laughs> Maybe a little bit. <laughs> We're giving you all the hard ones, okay? I, I know. I know. We need to really start picking on Jarrett soon. I'm really hoping we pick on him at some point. Hey, um, or, got a shirt or, and I'm going to have to start doing it myself. <laughs> He's, nice to He's got a shirt and tie on today. Okay. I know. I, I'm really quite impressed. He, he, well, he, actually, you know, if the audience wants, we do have a poll question that might be kind of fun at the end. Oh. We'll just give it a bit of a teaser. We'll see if everybody's interested, but go ahead. All right. So ma managing all the documents you need for collaborative process, this is going to fall on your financial professional in a big way. I give people a couple of options. You can, I have a secure link into my system where everybody has an individual link that they get and they can upload documentation to. They love it. They don't have to leave their home. They don't have to do too much running around. I always tell people, grab a glass of wine or a beer, sit down in front of your computer, save and upload, save and upload. <laughs> Easiest way to do it. Um, you know, managing it that way electronically. The, my other thing is, is that, you know, here's, here's my mailing address, um, courier everything there and I'll handle it. Um, most of the documents are going to fall onto your financial professional. It's up to us how we manage those documents. I know for me, I love taking chaos and making it simplistic. I do not believe in taking the simple and making it chaotic. So even when I'm doing a brief for my legal counsel, I want to make sure that everything is incredibly organized and laid out so that it's as simple as possible for everybody. I find simplicity saves people money. Can I drill down a little bit? So we're in a yeah. pandemic, right? Yeah. How do we physically get you the documents? And are you using a software program or how does mm -hmm. counsel get the documents? Certainly we're not doing what we did before with, you know, yeah. five bankers boxes floating around. Yeah, no, now what I do is I do, I have a, I have a, uh, a program that I use. And um, what I do is every single matter has a unique file code and every client has a unique file code. And then once I'm done dealing with all of their information, I s set up a separate file code that goes out to the professional team. So that's, for example, if uh, Russ, you and Jared are on the same team with me, I would send out my financial brief and I set it up the exact same way as I ever did a paper brief. So it's all tabbed out, you know exactly what's there, but you now get a code, you go into the code and you can download every single piece of documentation into your systems. It's all nice and secure. As soon as everybody has everything, 
I close the links and you're no longer allowed to get into it and your everything is secured off. That's very helpful. Thank you. And I think a huge benefit to that, Carrie, the way you do that is this is something I explain to clients a lot. And I think a lot of people don't realize until they get into a process like this is different law firms and different lawyers sometimes use different forms in different mm -hmm. documents. I still deal with a lot of old school lawyers that, that draft their own hand scratch net family property statement. Mm -hmm. I mean, and then you have two different lawyers and two different law firms putting different forms together and, and crossing like ships in the night in the night. And, and I say to clients that that just causes so much overhead and so much extra legal expense where if you have one professional gathering things the exact same way from both of you on the exact same dates in the exact same forms. What a cost saving technique. Well, you're getting an agreed statement of fact from one individual that's vetted everything that you're seeing and then cross references everything that you're seeing. Um, I, I, I couldn't think of if I was legal counsel, I put everything else how I would want it. Um, and what I would want to see and what my questions would be. And that's the way I kind of went at it is that if I was in your shoes, how would I want to receive this information? And organization is key. You, you can't hand over a mess. It, it's just not appropriate. I, I agree. Having one person organize the documents and then share it with the team is definitely the most efficient way to proceed. A couple audience questions came in and then we're going to go to our next uh, topic. Do you think a mortgage agent would have a niche in separation and divorce and can be an asset with a collaborative team during dispute resolution? Well, we know the answer to that, Carrie. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we're all I, personally. I'm always calling a mortgage agent and referring my clients to mortgage agents, saying, "Hey, I need you to find out. Can you get? Can you afford this house? Are yeah. you going to be able to do this?" And we know mortgage agents with collaborative practice training, they join the groups and they come into the meetings. They're fantastic. So the answer to that one is yes. Now they're quick and, uh, Russ, sorry, Russ, just to add to that, York uh, Regional Collaborative Practice and Durham Region Collaborative Practice both have associate memberships. So you don't need to be collaboratively trained. You can join as an associate member. And those associate members are mortgage brokers, real estate agents, uh, those type of people that we want to call on um, to help. It's a great way to network and build your own practice as a mortgage agent. So the answer to that is yes. One more quick question, and please keep your questions coming in. Um, since I had a mediator and the lawyers were present, does that mean I participated in the collaborative process? Or did I still participate in the mediation process? Well, watch our one-on-one program that explains the collaborative process, but that involves a participation and agreement and the lawyers have special training. And so my answer to that question would be probably not. What do you think, Jared? Yeah, um, it, it would, um, yeah, I would say it was still in the mediation type form yeah. that I, yeah. All right. So the Divorce Act, what well, we need to know, all these changes this last year or two, eh, Jared? Yeah, lots of changes. Um, I don't know if we're able to make it available after. I think we are, but um, everyone can go on the Government of Canada the websites, the provincial government. You can find out all the specific changes that came into effect on March 1st, um, just to bring yourself up, up to speed. I'm going to focus on three sort of changes that I think open the door for collaborative process. And I think that we need to focus on uh, when we're looking at files that could be handled in the collaborative process. One is they've really solidified the duties of the court and the duties of the professionals to talk to clients about what's it, what else is available other than court right off the get-go. Um, relocation and residency, two very tough issues to deal with in the collaborative process. I know we've had files carry uh, Russell and I on this issue, tough collaborative files. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit. And uh, they've entrenched the need to ascertain the voice of the child, the wishes of the child when considering uh, parenting uh, structures and, and frameworks. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit and how it can benefit the collaborative process and why collaborative process is maybe getting a bit more traction uh, because of it. Um, so first off, uh, Section 7 of the Divorce Act is now solidified. We have to talk 
uh, to clients about what else is available before they march off to court. We, we, we've had lots of clients come through the door and, and as one of my partners at my firm says, they just want to ram it into court. They come in and they're all gung ho. Well, the changes to uh, Section 7 of the Divorce Act make it incumbent on us now as the legal professionals to stop that, to tell them to pump the brakes, say, well, wait a second, there's these other options available. Mediation, um, mediation and collaborative process being the two most prevalent. And of course, I always push uh, collaborative process first because I'm uh, a big proponent of collaborative process. So uh, section 7.3 in particular uh, ingrains that it shall, the party shall try to resolve through a family dispute resolution process. It's no longer, you know, we encourage the courts to recommend this or we encourage the lawyers to recommend these other processes. It's now part of the legislation. So I think the thrust of a lot of the March 1st changes is just beefing up the legislation to start saying, okay, we're, this isn't laissez-faire anymore. You have to do these things. We have to push outside of court because court is backlogged, especially with the pandemic. Um, court's not the right place to be. So I think the legislators got this one right. They've made some of these changes to really push people to these other process options and um, so that's one in particular where I think we can take clients at a first uh, consult, talk to them about the, the options that are available. And it's just going to help the professionals sell collaborative process in a sense, because we're going to be able to say, we don't have a choice. I have to explain this to you. And if you just rush into court without considering these options, we may be looking at a cost award against us. Mm -hmm. So it's helped the, the lawyers and the professionals um, really explain to clients that this is no longer uh, your option. The, um, I found it interesting too that in the judges, if you talk to the judges, they say they've always been doing this. They've always been recommending, uh, they used to call it ADR, alternative dispute resolution, but now they call it FDR, family dispute resolution. Um, but they, uh, historically in Russ, you can jump in on this, but a lot of the judges would, would offer on-site mediation. Yeah. But not a lot of them were, were uh, encouraging people caught up in the court system to, to switch to collaborative. I think we're starting to see that shift now. Yeah, I think with, uh, you know, the, I can th think of seven or eight superior court judges who were collaborative professionals. Yeah. Uh, so they're 100% they're advocates. If they can get a matter off their court docket and into the collaborative process, uh, they'll do whatever it needs they need to to help you do that. We're going to talk a little bit about that coming up. But that's, those are some really, really good tips about the Divorce Act. Thank you, Jared. Let's run our next poll and get to some more audience questions. So uh, one audience question that came in online. Thank you again for submitting it. Are your collaborative meetings full team? I always start full team. What are you doing, Jared? Yeah, I, I always try to sell a full team. I, that poll you ran earlier um, was great because it hit a lot of the nails on the head. I get a lot of pushback from, from clients at the, at the onset of using a full team. And it's usually for those two biggest reasons. The cost, they see it as uh, added cost. A lot of times people are struggling just to afford a lawyer, let alone a full team. So we I get that a lot and I get that there's maybe one issue or maybe two issues where they feel like they want to hold back from collaborative process in a full team in, in, in general um, because of um, it overlaps into using collaborative process in general, but because they, they might want to go to court or they might want to reserve the ability to go to court. So I get a lot of pushback on that. Um, I talk to them about the benefits and the cost savings and the efficiency of it. I talk to them about the fact that they may not see it now, but it will be a better process and their satisfaction when, at the end of the road will be so much higher if they use a full team. Great stuff. All right, so I'm gonna introduce this uh, poll and then we're gonna do one more question. Oh, I'm not gonna introduce the poll. Here are the results, that's facts. Uh, what is the role of the expert in the collaborative process? Uh, provide expert opinion on a specific issue. Adjudicate, the clear majority, almost 60%. Adjudicate disputes, 13%. Resolve disputes, 17 Get the matter ready for litigation for other, so 8%. So 
Thank you everybody for participating in that poll. The um, one more quick audience question. No, let's let's keep going here. I want to be mindful of our team time. We're going to get back to the audience questions. So, expert reports, Carrie. What do we need to know? Oh, expert reports. They are wonderful things. You know, I guess in some ways, your family professional is providing you with an expert report when they're giving you their parenting plan. It's a great document that I look at as. When you had your children, nobody gave you an owner's manual on how to raise them or what to do with them next. That, that parenting. That explains it. <laughs> I know. It explains everything. <laughs> I'm looking going, the parenting plan is the best thing. You just got an owner manual for your kids. You now know how to, how to deal with them. I look at your separation agreement as your guarantee of how to behave going forward for your family. So I'm looking going, you're getting two manuals that you didn't have beforehand. So that works out really well. You know, our expert reports are phenomenal. Um, I know the two of us are, the three of us have done matters together where we've really leaned on those expert reports, whether it be for business valuations, they can be the difference between somebody getting nothing out of a business to some, to be us being able to become creative and finding resolution. Um, it, the expert reports help to take away trust issues is what I find. Um, we always have one person that's saying, I know this is going on. And the other person saying, absolutely not. We get that expert report and all of a sudden it's, oh, okay. I didn't understand or I didn't know. And it helps clarify those things and it helps to rebuild some of the trust. So whether that's a tax expert report, a business valuation report, sometimes it's just a matter of my report coming in. Not only just trust in the data right? But trust yeah. in the process as well, because by listening to the client's concerns and worries and walking it, walking through them with an expert, one example would be my husband has cash sales and runs personal expenses through the business, right? So yeah. the expert can, you can list those expenses for the expert. They can investigate it. They can report back to the team. Oftentimes there is some truth to it, right? There could be some cash sales and, and some personal elements to the business expense. And those are added back in. And But that process adds credibility to the parties involved. That's what I've found. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. And you know what? It's not just trust and process and, and, and trust and reports and things like that. It's actually rebuilding some of the family trust. Right. And it also gets them to that point when you were rebuilding some of that family trust, we're getting to the point where people can actually make decisions because they have good information. And when you have good information, you're going to make a good decision. All right. We want to save some time for questions. So runaway train. All right. So this is uh, what we're talking about here are these litigation files that are out of control. JJ, what can collaborative practice do for crazy litigation? Yeah, uh, thanks, Russ. There's a huge amount of files that are locked into this never-ending court cycle, and we try to identify those files and pull them out and, and uh, as Russ always says, bring them into the next station. Right. And um, a lot of times we find, and, and us three have worked on files like this, I've worked on files like this with other professionals, a lot of times it just ended up being put into court for maybe one specific reason, a disclosure issue or an immediate concern. And then once a temporary order was made over that one issue, they just stayed locked in the court process because that's where they were. And no one thought to say, well, well, wait a second, we might be able to deal with nine out of the 10 issues over here in collaborative process. So the idea behind runaway train is taking those files into the collaborative process, but, but how do we do it? These are the steps we follow. There's about seven steps in the model that we use to basically do that. And okay. the first step give is- Give us a step in like a minute or two. Yeah. <laughs> the, the first step <laughs> is, the, uh, is the Oscar music playing yet? Yeah, well, we're going to do some rapid fire just so we can save, save time yeah. for Q&A. So first of all, you have to get the parties to stop the court process and agree to the collaborative process. And then you have to decide whether you're fully withdrawing from the court process or just suspending the court process. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more in the presentation. Then you have to possibly amend your collaborative participation agreement 
if the court action is going to remain live. And we'll talk about that a little bit further as well and the pros and cons and how we do that. Um, next, we have to bring in the team. We have to contact the neutral professionals. Next, we have to have our meetings, we have to gather our information, and we have to reach a settlement. Then we decide whether we hop back into court to finish the divorce or whether any parts of the final separation agreement that uh, contains the resolution in the collaborative process needs to be incorporated back into a court order. So having that court action suspended, there's some benefits in how we pull up the, the train into the next station, the collaborative station. Um, but again, that's, a, that's kind of the model we use. That's the seven steps of pulling a matter that's been in, stuck in court for maybe two years unnecessarily, bring it into the collaborative process and cleaning it up with a final, final uh, separation agreement. Great summary. We have full programs on all these subject matters, Divorce Act changes, Runaway Train, Golden Goose. So we're just giving a flavor today, but we do a deeper dive. Let's run the poll. Um, and Carrie's going to spend a minute or two briefly telling us about saving the golden goose. The poll is in what areas can an expert assist the collaborative team? Two minutes or less, golden goose. What you got, Carrie? Golden goose, honestly, this is all about saving that family business. The business is the heartbud for so many families where it is not only uh, supporting one person, it's supporting everyone. So how do we save it? knowing that we have to go through an equalization process. Um, my business evaluators are my best friends when saving businesses. We can get creative. We can find ways that we can have a business be viable, remain viable, and everybody gets what they need out of it. We can get incredibly creative when we're, when we're in the collaborative process which is not always afforded to us when we're in a litigation process. So first thing in saving that golden goose is having the right business evaluator doing the business evaluation so that we can start moving forward. And that may include also income determinations for the parties and seeing what's been run through the, through the business that actually is a family expense and what can still be run through and what can't be run through and how do we deal with those pesky business partners that are not part of the family that are going, what about me? What about me? So we want, this is the main thing about saving the okay. Your audio is cutting it there. Uh, but a lot, the, lot of parties to look after. We've got a lot of things to look at. Sorry, your audio at is breaking the end up. Of the day. Sorry, your audio. I just is lost you for a sec. Your audio yeah. is breaking up. That's oh, and fun. I even put on a microphone. You're good. So the goose is the family business and we want to save the goose using the collaborative process so that it keeps generating income for the family and the children. Let's see our poll results and what do we got here? Well, tax, legacy, corporate, business, income, parenting, other. That's exactly right. You can use experts in all these areas uh, and many families won't need an expert for each one of these areas but uh, it's something to consider, especially um, if you're going full team. So do you guys want to do a quick fun poll and then get into the Q&A Q or you want to get into the Q&A? What do you think? I think we need a fun poll. Let's run this poll. Let's see what people are thinking. Okay. And while we're running in this poll, <laughs> Jared, in uh, two minutes or less, tell us about impasse. Yeah. So impasse happens in the collaborative process. I'll try to be serious when I talk about this with that pull up in front of me. <laughs> You're right a great now. guy for letting us have some fun with you. We love you. You know that, right? But, yeah, I love you too. So impasse happens in the collaborative process and everyone is committed to keeping the collaborative process alive. So what do we do? We look at options to get through impasse that doesn't end the collaborative process. We look at bringing in senior counsel for second opinions with, who are collaboratively trained. We look at doing assessments. We look at the parties going to a senior counsel who's collaboratively trained or a parenting professional or a financial professional together to get an independent opinion from maybe an expert in the field and bring that information back to the collaborative process. Russ and I had a file where we didn't think it was going to ever settle. Uh, we thought the process may uh, eventually terminate. We brought in, set up a process to get a very neutral and objective opinion from a lawyer who's practiced for 30 years and knew that particular area of law very well. 
The parties each submitted a one-page summary canvassed with their lawyers first to help them develop that one-page summary. They went and met with that lawyer together, came back to the process. He came back to the process, the independent second opinion lawyer, gave them his objective opinion, and we end up settling the case. So there can be lots of options we look at to get through process that doesn't necessarily result in terminating the collaborative process. And, you know, that's one of the biggest objections, right, for both clients and lawyers. You know, what if we hit impasse? The clients, I, I don't want to lose this client or the client saying, I don't, I want you to be my lawyer if we go to court, right? So impasse is always a huge problem, but there's creative ways that you can get through it. Oftentimes, oftentimes I find when you hit impasse, that usually means you're probably close to selling the case. Yes, Carrie? I think when what we should be telling our clients at the very beginning, it's not if, it's when we hit impasse. Right. There is impasse on every single file and, and we can resolve them and we can get creative in our, res, in our resolutions, which is fantastic. So it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Yeah. And it's a normal part of the process, right? It's, Absolutely. You need to normalize it. It's going to happen. We have a strategy and a plan on how to work through it. All right, let's do some more Q&A, um, bring our host back. Thank you guys. This was really a fantastic presentation today. And here's Shannon. Hi, thank you. Thank you so much, Carrie, Jared, and Russell. That was very insightful. We hope you all enjoyed. Um, and we hope that we've answered, or that the panelists have answered um, quite a few questions throughout. Uh, we have a couple more minutes though, so we'll try and squeeze a few more in here. So first one we have is, what do you do if the other party is being completely unreasonable, they disagree in everything you propose to get an agreement? Mm. It's funny, I just had this problem. <laughs> well, stick <laughs> right here. <laughs> uh, honestly, I always go back to the why and asking them, what do they object to? What do they see as resolution? And, 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 and why, why are th certain things upsetting them? I think this is a great thing uh, for having our family professional involved. They can get down to some of those root issues. And sometimes it's a lot of that is the person doesn't feel like they've been heard. And, you know, the heard issue is that they're not connected at all, right? Somebody's upset about a relationship issue and it's holding up the settlement on an asset. But it yeah. might dig down and find out really what is the basis of the objection. That's a really insightful, Carrie. Do we have time for one more, Shannon? Uh, it looks like we have time for one more here. So last question we have is, in the joint spreadsheet, how do you determine the date you use to establish the cost basis of something that has a widely fluctuating value? Say, for example, a quarter of a diversified portfolio is invested in the International Equity Fund. JJ, you want to hit that one out of the park? I, that's a financial question, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the, it's the date of separation, right? It's what the legislation well, is. But what do you think, Carrie? I say, you know what? We always start with the date of separation 100% of the time is we say, what is the value on the date of separation? And then the wonderful thing, again, about collaborative is we look at, are there adjustments that have to be made after the data separation? If it's a joint portfolio, they're going to take their, their losses and their increases together, which is fantastic. If it's solely owned and we have some catastrophic, catastrophic event within the marketplace, then I think it's something that we can talk about. And that's the best part about collaborative is that although we're gonna put it into the legal model first, because you need to know what that model looks like, we can talk about it and see, is there an adjustment that needs to be made and is it reasonable? Great answer. Jen? Great, thank you. I think that's all the time that we have for questions today. Thank you so much to everyone who sent them in. And we just want to thank our panelists once again, Carrie and Jarrett, we really appreciate you being here today with our team to share your expertise and insights. And we also just wanna say a big thank you to all of our audience members who sent in questions and participated. We really appreciate it. 
And um, just a reminder to keep an eye out for an email tomorrow that will be sent to you with resources on today's topic. And if you do have any general questions about our virtual event series or any comments for our team, please feel free to reach out to me at shannon at russellalexander.com. There'll also be a survey that pops up in your browser following the webinar. So please, if you have the time, we welcome and appreciate any feedback you have because that helps us grow and develop our program even further. We'd love to hear from you. And one of the questions on the survey will be to share your thoughts on topics that you'd like to, to see our team present on in the future. So again, please send, send those in if you have the time. And we will continue to host our virtual event series bi-weekly. Our next webinar is on Wednesday, January 26th, and that will be on common law separations. And you can now register for that. And you can, if you'd like to learn more on that topic, I'll be including a full list of our upcoming webinars in that email tomorrow as well. So we just want to thank you once again, and we hope you all have a great day. I don't know how you do it. You're amazing, <laughs> Shannon. Thank you so much. All for you guys. Jared, all done. Staff, Thanks, guys. Jerry, that was a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Is, do I hear something in the background there? <laughs> I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Oh. Oh. The stress of it all. I need to work on my DJ skills. There you go. Oh, there we go. Finish it off strong. Oh, yeah. <laughs> all right, guys. Have a great afternoon. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Have a great day, everyone. Bye. You were very nice to me on the pool. I appreciate that, everyone. <laughs> they were very oh, nice to you on the pool. Oh, yeah, I would have been nice to you on the pool. <laughs> I know you wouldn't have. I know. But Jared, why are you on the poll? And what are you doing on the poll? Hey, the host. The host are we were, still recording? The hosts were allowed to vote. <laughs> I'm still waiting for the music to come on. Okay, guys. Um, have a good afternoon. Thank you.